Welcome. Some people think I know too much about tabloids. <laughs> I don't know about that. But I know, I think, too much about tabloids. Um, that's for sure. For me, they're like a conceptual carousel. Sometimes they're a little bit more peripheral to my critical thinking. Sometimes they're coming back closer to the, the centre of my, my critical thinking. I think it's very important to stress that the tabloid, tabloidization, the trends within the tabloids are not issues which emerge out of the here and the now, but they are issues which have a very subtle and prolonged and insistent history within the uh, evolution of our mass media systems. So today, what I'll be doing is I'll be looking predominantly at images. I won't be commenting on them as images, but I'll be using them as illustration of some of the arguments that I will be making. So if you're wondering whether this lecture is on Mole 2, it's not. I think this amount of images would just close down Mole 2 for a week. Uh, too much tabloid imagery is not good for any online learning environment. <laughs> However, the general trends within the lecture are, are threaded through lots of the things that I've written. So this lecture today, unlike lectures in weeks gone by, is, is heavy on argument and illustration and not necessarily uh, heavy on facts and figures. The facts and figures, they're there for you in the books, in the literature. What I'd just like to do today is to, to prompt you and provoke you. Because, of course, one of your essay titles is, if you're doing this course, and those sitting at the back in the cheap seats, they might want to do the essays as well, but there's no compulsion, they're not mandatory. Um, one of the essay questions for people taking the course Journalism in Britain is, in fact, are we living in a tabloid golden age? So I'm not going to give the answer away. That's for you to tell me, and maybe you will use today's uh, arguments as part of your argument. So the golden age of the tabloid, are we living through a golden age? And I think it's, it's provocative and productive to actually pose that question so that we immediately occupy a space which is not a pejorative um, looking down at tabloids space, but an evaluative space. Actually looking at tabloids with our critical eyes open, not our prejudices uh, fine, finely tuned. What I'll be looking at today, and these are conceptually very rich terms, and I'm not going to go anywhere near the conceptual wealth that they contain, but I'll be looking at a process which is an ongoing process, and that ongoing process is, we might say, a movement from the popular press to tabloid culture. And I'll be making the argument that we've moved beyond the question of whether the mass media are being tabloidized. We've moved beyond the notion that the tabloid is somehow enclosed within a particular format. And we're now into an era where the tabloid is the norm. The tabloid is the mainstream. And we might ask ourselves, does it feel so very bad to be living through the tabloid golden age? Will we tell our grandchildren about it? Will we boast about it? I can see shaking of heads already. And I'm, I can see your essay winging its way towards me. Let's have a look way back when. 1842, the Penny Sunday Chronicle. And a really important thing to stress is that within the UK, in the Victorian era, Sunday newspapers were bad news. They were bad news because Britain was still a predominantly active Christian society. 
And Sunday is the day of worship within a Christian society. So people, especially working class people, should not, according to the religious and political elites, have been reading newspapers on a Sunday. They should have been at church and praying and doing wholesome things like that. The early Sunday newspapers knew that there was this opening in a market which wasn't driven by the interests of the elite or their moral values, but it was much more focused towards the commercial imperative of making money out of people who wanted to read newspapers on a Sunday. And what these newspapers did, very adroitly, was that they combined the politics of the earlier radical press, a proto-socialist press, uh, an emergent trade unionist press, with a sensationalist approach to the presentation of news. And this is a really ex excellent example of that, the murder of the working classes. So the newspaper will be full of commercial uh, opportunities and adverts, but the front page and the main story within it is a sensational account of how the working classes are not just being exploited down the mines, but they're actually being murdered. Provocative, sensationalist, and ultimately rather empty political rhetoric, because the prime function of the Penny Sunday Chronicle was not to organize people politically, but actually was to make money out of their political and social interests. And it's interesting there to see the, um, I'll just check if you're looking at what I'm looking at. Yeah, yeah, technology is up to date, that's good. Um, <laughs> it's also interesting to look at the subtitles there. One of them reinforces my point, the People's Weekly Advertiser. And the second gives us the flavour of what we might argue becomes the staple tabloid diet down the centuries. Sporting and Police Gazette and newspaper of romance. And we still have lots of sport, lots of crime, and in a different sort of way, a lot of romance. If you think, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here, is romance. Or the X Factor has a romantic tinge to it. From a different perspective, another much less regular, but very, very popular form of popular print publication were the last um, testaments and confessions of convicted criminals. Of course, right the way through the mid-Victorian period, a hanging was a good day out. You'd take your children, take something to eat, you'd meet your friends, you'd get drunk. You'd laugh at the man dangling at the end of the rope. This was mass entertainment in the Victorian era. And look at the way the woodcut works there. The life, trial and execution of Christian Sattler for the murder of Thane, the detective. Stories about cop killers, every much as resonant with a fearful readership then as they would be now. And you can see the interview, the letter, Sattler's last moments, the condemned sermon, the trial, the verdict, the judge's address. All of these headlines in a one-off broadsheet 50 years before W.T. Stead imports the notion of the headline to the evening metropolitan newspaper, the Pall Mall Gazette, in the 1880s. We don't have to look at that for too long to see that there is a, a visual connection between that sort of big, bold, capitalized, um, blunt tabloid headline of that era and what follows. And for those of you who've heard a lot about the Daily Mail but never seen a copy from 1896, this was the newspaper which revolutionized the British news media. Its implications, I would argue, 
are still being worked out within mass media markets in Britain. But look at it. For a start, that's the front page. The front page, as with all newspapers at that time, was dominated, if not exclusively filled with advertising. But look at what's going on. Look up in the top right-hand corner, as I'm looking at it, and it claims it's the busy man's daily journal. Look over on the other side, a penny newspaper for one half penny. It's a bargain. It's trying to stress the idea that this is news for everyone, and it's cheap. It's cheerful. Why the front page covered with advertising? Because newspapers still, even newspapers which were destined for readerships of a million within four years, like the Daily Mail, needed to foreground their economic, their commercial respectability. It wasn't until later that this idea of the mass um, appeal to a large readership starts to be actually tagged on to the interests of a mass readership. The tabloid. The tabloid is a word which first describes a little pill. It's a small tablet, a tabloid. And the metaphor is transferred over to a small format newspaper. Pulitzer invited Harmsworth, the owner of the Daily Mail, over to New York to run a stunt. And the stunt was to actually run a tabloid newspaper. Tabloid in size and tabloid in, in intent. And it claims here that it is the daily time saver. Again, the notion here is the busy man. Harmsworth idea that what is really required is a newspaper which can condense the news into a small format. Further down, news in a minute were to find it. However, the tabloid itself, this small newspaper, was not to become an instant success. Pulitzer didn't go with it. Um, Harmsworth went with it in 1903 with the Daily Mirror, which was first launched, as you all know, um, as a women's newspaper written by women for women, and it failed within 12 months. Harmsworth relaunched it as tabloid format, but as an illustrated daily newspaper. Very, very different from what we now understand as the, the visual appeal of a general newspaper. For that, we have to wait until the impact of the American experimentation with the tabloid format. And here is a striking illustration. A striking illustration of the values, of the sensation, of the appeal to a lowest common denominator in a populist audience in New York's first successful tabloid newspaper from the late 1920s. And here we have Ruth Snyder in the electric chair. And what we're told is that an intrepid reporter, tabloid newspaper reporter, um, went to the execution of the convicted murderer, Ruth Snyder, and sat there in the front row with a camera. I'm looking at these cameras. In public display, because the journalist had a camera somewhere on his leg. And at the moment of death, he pulled up the trouser leg, pressed the automatic cord, took the exposure of the woman as she literally fried in the electric chair. <laughs> Catapult ourselves forward to Saddam Hussein's execution and think of the furor about the publication of those smartphone images in newspapers. Think about the, um, 
the murder, stroke, execution, stroke, death of um, Gaddafi, and we see similar concerns for uh, public, the, the, the balancing between the ability to demonstrate visually what actually happened and the sensitivities of a public um, thinking perhaps this image has stepped too far beyond the bounds of good and proper taste. So it's emerging from the United States at this particular era. And at the same period, 1933, we have a refreshing of the rather staid format of the popular, the mass popular newspapers. At this point, the Daily Express was the best-selling newspaper in the UK. In 1933, in August, it relaunches. Look at that and cast your minds back to the Daily Mail's front page of a few slides ago, and you will see that there's an awful lot more going on in terms of the use of typefaces, font size, uh, image, and this idea of uh, general interest news, um, people sitting in fountains. Widowed beauty seeks air solace. Uh, solace, not a word you would associate with the front pages of tabloids these days, indicating that it's as much a linguistic shift as a visual shift. And down at the bottom, there's actually um, some lines of verse composed to the triumph of type. Um, it's about the typeface used on the new Daily Express. Through the 1930s, you see the development of the most important British tabloid newspaper. The Daily Mirror goes in um, 1934 from being the pictorial daily newspaper aimed at a very sedate woman middle class audience to something much more radical, something which is attempting to market itself towards a young, affluent, mixed gender readership. And a readership which, in general terms, is Labour Party supporting, if not Labour Party voting. Interestingly, the reason why the Daily Mirror goes for that appeal to the working classes, to the trade unionists, to young people, is not because of some deep political or social conviction. It's because the marketers actually say there's a gap there. There isn't a newspaper which is commercially orientated, which is appealing to young people, which is appealing to people who may be to the left of the political spectrum. During the Second World War, the Daily Mirror enters its halcyon period. It enters its, 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 its grand epoch. And by the end of the war, it's running a fabulously subtle electoral campaign, never actually saying, vote for Labour. Look at the headline, vote for them. Them are the men, the husbands, the brothers, the cousins, the nephews, the sons, who've been away, who may not be back in Britain to vote. Vote for them is targeted towards women the sisters, the wives, etc., etc. It's saying to women voters, vote for the men who have fought the war. Vote for the men so that we don't end up back in a situation of mass unemployment, rearmament, and world war. It's a radical stance for a popular tabloid newspaper. That's its front page coming up to the election. The, the slogan of the newspaper is Forward with the People. And here we have the poignant image of the soldier returning and saying resonantly, here's peace, don't lose it again. This, in a very, very small thumbnail sketch, demonstrates that there's nothing intrinsically reactionary about a tabloid newspaper. A tabloid newspaper can be as enlightened, as socially progressive as any other form of newspaper. So if we're living through a tabloid culture, 
that tabloid culture is developed by and engaged with through human agency. What that tabloid culture means, what it actually indicates, is up to us to define how we use it, how we engage with it. So tabloids at this stage and tabloids further down the line are not intrinsically reactionary, unpleasant, sexist, racist. They can also do good stuff. That's not good stuff. That is leaping forwards. Rupert Murdoch takes over the newspaper The Sun in 1969. He thinks to himself that the Daily Mirror has become too clever. It's become too socially aware. It's forgot, actually, how it got into its premier position in the first place, which was commercially appealing to young working class readers. So Murdoch arrives and attempts to undercut the readership and the, the tastes of the Daily Mirror. And this, during the Falklands War, is one of those headlines. There are many. This is probably just the most famous. This gotcha, the, the cartoon-sounding headline, which a actually masks the fact that several hundred young Argentinian conscripts who had no choice about whether they were at war or not, had actually lost their lives in this incident. Um, that headline ran for one edition, and then it was taken out, because Murdoch appreciated that this is not good journalism. Journalism that is there on the record as offending the general public is never a good idea, as Murdoch found to his cost some time later. But that's another story. The Sun newspaper rises and rises in influence until by the late 1980s, 1988 I think, it peaks at about four and a half million uh, purchases of that newspaper. Advertisers multiply that figure upwards. That means that in the late 1980s, something approaching 13 million people on these islands were reading a copy of The Sun each day which is impressive financially, possibly alarming politically, and in terms of newspapers, a point which we will never see again. Enter another story. A newspaper is launched in 1843. So we're going to actually look at the development of the news of the world. And I'll make two arguments. One is that when it starts, it sells itself as being the embodiment of the novelty of the nation. And the first part of that uh, point, residual radicalism, is what I argue gives an awful lot of tabloid culture its power, its purchase. The news of the world might be selling truckloads of copies. It might be novel, it might be innovative, but its whole appeal is that somewhere at its core it has a radical approach and it's a radical approach which embodies the interests of the ordinary people, the proletariat. From 1843 the news of the world comes through 60 or 70 pretty mediocre years. It's nothing special. It's a Sunday newspaper which survives. It's not up there with Reynolds News. It's not up there with Lloyd's, London Illustrated newspaper, both of which are peaking up to the million sales per week by the end of the Victorian era. In fact, it's on the cusp of closing by the start of the First World War. And this is a page from 1910 after its, its relaunch. And for fans of Table Source among you, you'll see an example of HP Source. HP Source, fine institution. HP standing for Houses of Parliament, because that's what members of Parliament put on their chips when they were having their dinner in the Houses of Parliament in 1910. News of the World contains more news than any other paper 
It's a strange sort of claim to our contemporary internet-driven senses that a newspaper, particularly a Sunday newspaper, is selling itself on the basis of the fact that it has more news. And this is one of the things that actually starts to identify the news of the world as brand through the early part of the 20th century and through, I'd argue, right the way up until 1984 when it becomes a tabloid, very late in the game. Here we see the main story, Crippin. Crippin had murdered his wife. That's always news. <coughs> Crippin had run away. That's also always news. Crippin was caught, as you will see if you can decipher that picture down at the bottom of the page, by the use of the telegraph. He thought he'd got away, getting through the port in England. They telegraphed to the United States and said, he's arriving in a couple of hours. And they arrested him as he stepped off in America. So the news of the world gains this reputation of producing a very broad range of Sunday news, particularly news for sports fans, particularly sensation, particularly gossip. This has never been as well illustrated as in the 1960s. You have the Profumo affair. Profumo was um, a member of the Conservative government. Um, he was the head of the Ministry of Defence, which I think at the time was still called the Ministry of War. Um, and he was going to parties. That's not news. Even Conservative members of Parliament are allowed to go to parties. But at those parties, there was sex, drugs, and probably rock and roll. 1963, just about. Again, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, I think Conservative Party MPs could actually manage those three things in 1963. However, there was one particular woman, Christine Keeler, who Profumo, it turned out, was sharing with a man called Ivanov. The name tells you all of your suspicions are coming true. Ivanov was a naval attaché at the Soviet embassy. Naval attaché is just a polite way of saying he was a spy. So she was the minister of war's mistress at the same time as she was the mistress of a Soviet spy based in London. This was bad news, even for the Conservative Party, even in 1963. Profumo lost his job, great crisis. News of the world has an opportunity to demonstrate, and this is really at the heart of lots of the claims of tabloid culture, and tabloid newspapers in particular, that actually you've got to follow the dirt. Because if you follow the dirt, it takes you places that those in power don't want you to go to. This was their Watergate. The Christine Keeler, the Profumo affair. And in retrospect, we will see that it justifies all sorts of poor levels of behavior, poor standards of journalistic ethics. They'll do it because it might expose corruption in high places. George Orwell, writing in The Decline of the English Murder and other essays, has a, a fine gentleman there sitting in a bar reading the news of the world. The news of the world had become so much integrated within the fabric of British life, so iconic in British life, that Orwell could write about it, it's Sunday afternoon before the war, the wife is already asleep in the armchair and the children have been sent out for a nice long walk. You put your feet up on the sofa, settle your spectacles on your nose and open the news of the world. The news of the world at its peak in the 50s and early 60s was selling 8.5 million copies. Again, 
multiply by that, th that, that by three, you get to approximately half the adult literate population of the country. The News of the World was a vital tool to understand the popular taste of Britain in these years. It reflected so much more about what was happening in Britain than the simple information of who was doing what. It was almost like a barometer of the national taste. That's a street in Liverpool. I know that. I lived there. Not in that street. But in Liverpool. And in the early 60s, there you have a sign up on the wall. The news of the world is everyone's business. All human life is there. This was the catch-all, the slogan, justifying the behaviour of a newspaper that was not yet tabloid in size, but was certainly tabloid in orientation and in taste. We look at a, a postcard from the time, and you see here, News of the World, man murders wife, wife poisons husband as headlines, and the anxious uh, little daughter looks up at her father and says, Dad, it says here that marriages are made in heaven. Is that right? And the dad says rather cynically, yes, but they finish up in the news of the world. <laughs> and again, this is just a code for how deeply ingrained within the patterns of popular culture this newspaper had become. And it was setting standards, it was setting comparisons for other news media to follow, particularly the Sunday press. In 1984, it becomes a tabloid. And if we, if we subscribe to some sort of like linear view of media history, we might say, and the rest is glory. It became tabloid, it put on sales, it was much more influential, uh, Murdoch still owns it, um, and he's using it as the cornerstone of his media empire in the 21st century. Obviously, nothing could be further from the truth. I would argue that in going tabloid in 1984, which is a long time after most other newspapers had gone tabloid, the format squeezes out one of its main claims to fame, which was the generality of its news, the breadth of its news. So what we're seeing here is a reduced diet on the front page, but we see all of the indicators of the move towards a very dramatic engagement with general popular culture. Um, the Rosemary Conley bikini diet. Um, Simply Red's Mix Love is a Vice Girl. World exclusive. The world wants to know this. I'm secret dad of Paulie Yates. Huey Green's shock confession. It's such a world conclusive, exclusive that I'm sure that 97% of the world's population who are sitting here today are actually thinking, who's Huey Green? See me afterwards. Um, later on, in, uh, no, just before that, you see another classic um, tabloid sting where the deputy chairman of the Conservative Party, they always do the best scandals, the Conservative Party, um, Geoffrey Archer um, pays off a vice girl. The vice girl was basically wired up. The News of the World set it up, and um, uh, the Tory boss is actually uh, set to quit over our story. So we can see the general direction that this, this trend is taking us in. We come up closer to home, and we see here a match fixer. One word headline, court, exclamation mark. Again, world exclusive. And you see here Muhammad Amir, a Pakistani bowler, a very famous Pakistani bowler, who's been caught cheating and selling the proceeds of that cheating um, for money. And you can see here the typical tabloid treatment. We expose betting scandal that will rock cricket. Pages 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and sport. Plus, see our shocking video at 
notw.co.uk. This is the sort of thing that this particular tabloid weekly is doing more and more and more, pushing the limits of its investigative journalism into areas where it thinks it can steal a march on its rivals, into areas where the daily tabloid newspapers aren't actually uh, covering. And therein lies the News of the World's ultimate problem. How do you continue to be a distinctive tabloid Sunday newspaper in a world of 24-hour news? How do you actually keep ahead of the gossip when everybody is on the gossip? How do you actually stay a cut ahead of your rivals? The answer is, you break the law. Pushing close to breaking the law was the crime buster, Mazia Mahmoud, euphemistically known as the News of the World Investigations Editor. He was responsible for most of these very, very high profile and um, um, for circulation purposes, very appealing um, investigations. So, number one, somebody jailed for seven years in 1998 for taking on Maz as a hitman to murder his mistress, a local general practitioner. Bruce Allen sentenced to 18 months for selling depraved videos of a 12-year-old girl being abused by an elderly pervert. Um, and so it goes on. Each of these... Um, Gary Pennant, the father of a footballer in the Premiership, was sent down for four years in 2008 for supplying Mazia Mahmoud with crack and heroin. Presumably, if Gary Pennant's son didn't play football for a Premiership team, the News of the World would have let him alone. It's just the fact that he's got a celebrity son and sells drugs, which is a problem in combination. One of the most prominent justifications in recent years was post the murder of Sarah Payne, who is pictured there. And the News of the World, actually using its profile as the largest selling um, paper in the country, starts off, if you are a parent, you must read this. And it starts a campaign for something which became known in populist terms as Sarah's Law. In another newspaper uh, clipping I've got, you actually can see the, the petition where readers were asked to fill in their names and addresses and post this to the newspaper, which then presented it as a petition. A very direct hooking up with populist sentiment. And what the newspaper claimed that it managed to affect was a change in the law which meant that people had the right to know if they had a convicted um, sex offender living near them. This was Sarah's law. An ideal demonstration, if you like, that at the same time as they were breaking laws or testing laws to destruction in their gathering of news, they were actually involved in pushing government towards changing law and legislation. In its final edition on 10th of July in 2011, Sarah Payne actually claims that the News of the World proved that it is a force for good. The, um, the mother of the murdered child is there profiled in the newspaper arguing this newspaper did good things. It had been decided that it was being closed. This was the final edition. But there she was, prominently arguing that the news of the world has actually been a driving force behind the Sarah's Law campaign. And there's the, the final page of the final edition. They think it's all over. It is now. But this isn't quite yet. To return to the opening argument, I think that 
We could draw on other examples, we could look at other media, we could look at elite newspapers, and we could demonstrate that, to a large extent, those media have moved into sometimes a formal engagement with tabloid format, a formal engagement with the language and imagery of um, tabloid uh, style. And we might argue that the news of the world becomes redundant at a point when the tabloid itself, the biggest, baddest, boldest tabloid in Britain, closes because British society has no more need of it. And that's not to say that British society has grown out of it. No, the opposite has happened, that it's no longer needed because the tabloid culture, which it, it has done so much to generate, has now actually permeated all the way through our news media. So a specific big bad tabloid is possibly no longer in our tabloid culture golden age as necessary as it once was. So the tabloid, whether format or style, moves from the margins to the mainstream. You can look at examples from front pages of uh, elite newspapers with popular cultural references. You look at, at the ways in which the uh, length of political stories on flagship BBC programmes has reduced over the years and pose that question whether the search for the soundbite, the search for the popular cultural reference is all part of a more generalised tabloid culture. So it asks us to ponder what is the contemporary mainstream. And even if we think now as tabloid newspapers on a daily basis are losing readers month by month by month, you could do your sums and you could count up on your fingers and you'd say tabloid newspapers, popular tabloids, I'm talking the Daily Star, I'm talking the Sun, I'm talking the Daily Mirror, I'm talking the Daily Mail and the Daily Express. They still probably sell somewhere in the region of six to seven million copies per day. That still gives you somewhere around 16, 17 million readers. As I've said to you before, that's not marginal, that's mainstream. And politically, newspapers like The Sun, newspapers like The Daily Mail, still have a massive influence in chastising government, in uh, keeping uh, the BBC uh, coward in a corner, um, although the BBC doesn't need newspapers to keep it coward in a corner just at the moment. It's doing that all by itself. Tabloid culture is, to simplify a complex argument that I haven't gone into today, it's visual. And I think I've shown elements of the visualisation of popular culture that leads to tabloid culture in the contemporary. It is populist, and by populist I mean not radically popular, not on the side of popular political change, on behalf of people and their interests, I mean echoing sentiments expressed by people which chime with the interests, commercial and political, of newspapers. Populist is not necessarily politically radical. It is socially mediated increasingly, hence this desperate need that the news of the world felt to tap into people's telephones. How else was it going to stay ahead of the gossip game when everybody can use their social media to find out and disseminate the crudest form of gossip? And the answer, the news of the world stayed ahead of the game by breaking the law. Tabloid culture is celebrity-driven. Um, political theorists argue that that's n not necessarily a bad thing. 
celebrity may be simply a portal through which common political with a small p concerns are mediated. So are we living through a tabloid golden age? For those of you who are doing the module, I look forward to your answers. To others, I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. So we have some time for uh, questions. We'll see how many, how many we get. Um, uh, raise your hands and, and one of us will call it. I mean, most of the tabloids are the cheapest papers on the market. How much an effect do you think the price has on their popularity, on their readership? Um, I think that's, that's, down the years, that's been a, a huge impact because the, the other thing that you take into consideration is the advertising. So tabloids get cheaper advertising or advertising from cheaper um, products. So if you're, if you're running an elite newspaper, then you're taking in advertising which, which flatters the, uh, the financial aspirations of your reader. Um, if you're running a, a popular tabloid, then you're running adverts which map onto the economic necessities of your reader. Um, really straightforward, you know, if you pick up a copy of the Daily Star, you might be getting free vouchers for uh, buy three, get two on top at Burger King or something, you know. Uh, if you're looking at the, the Guardian, you might be getting free tokens for Starbucks. It's a social class differential there. People that eat in Burger King, I guess, are not the same market quadrant that are going to Starbucks. Um, or if they are, the advertisers haven't stumbled on that yet. So I, I think it's really important that the, the, the price actually matches on to the the quantity of, of the readers, but paradoxically, the tabloids, popular tabloids are much more dependent on the daily sale than they are on their advertising revenue. So, so, um, which, one, which one do you prefer? The tab, tabloid journalism is the bad journalism, or they are doing something for human interest? I mean, I go back to the, the Daily Mirror from 1945. Some of the best journalism can be tabloid journalism, no doubt about it. Um, one of the examples I use in, um, in tabloid Britain is a critique of the English cricket authorities' attitude towards Robert Mugabe and Zimbabwe. And it's in the Daily Star. And it's in vulgar language, um, and it's politically very potent, but it's asking questions in a fashion that would really shake up a reader and think, hmm, what's happening here? It takes you beyond cricket. Whereas some of the worst, some of the most cowardly journalism of the 1980s around South Africa, you had prominent journalists on very, very well-respected newspapers saying, yeah, okay. You can send cricketers to play cricket in white South Africa against white-only teams because you shouldn't mix politics and sport. So that political dividing line, historically, has not been one that you could say the tabloids do things badly and the elite press do things well. Also in terms of journalism is, is basically it's, it's matching image and text to audience expectation. That's all it is. So if you're actually looking at a piece of journalism in a tabloid newspaper which does that effectively and explains what's happening to its target audience, it's successful journalism. One of the most prominent um, political editors is the son's Trevor Kavanagh. And Trevor Kavanagh's speciality, whatever you think of his politics, and his politics are Rupert Murdoch's right-wing politics, but when he writes about politics in The Sun, he's writing for a largely working class, 
largely under-educated readership, and he does it brilliantly. He simplifies without patronising, and he gets the messages across. And there's a story associated with that, because poor Trevor Kavanagh, in 1997, was phoned up by Rupert Murdoch, and he said, Trevor, we're changing our allegiance to the Labour Party. This guy had been the scribe of the new right for the best part of 15 years. And he queried that, and he said, how can I carry on writing political commentary for The Sun if it's shifted to be a Labour newspaper? And Rupert Murdoch said, don't worry, it won't make any difference. You can still carry on writing what you wrote. We're supporting Labour pragmatically, but the politics of the paper haven't changed. Sorry, Scott. You mentioned that kind of confirmation process that they go through writing the readers. Um, in Nick Davies' Flat Earth News, he talks about how the kind of stories are selected, like especially in the Daily Mail, just on what the readers want to hear. Do you think that's a kind of healthy process, really, for if journalism is going to be like a public sphere? Do you think it's a healthy process that people are just being fed their own thoughts back to themselves through newspapers? That's something that historically Mark Hampton looks at in that book, Visions of the Press, in Britain, 1850s, 1950. And if you recall from that book, he's talking about a shift from newspapers being um, educational to newspapers being representative. And by representative, he means exactly that. Crude or subtle, newspapers, probably more than any news medium, actually map their news onto an already known constituency. And if they weren't doing that, I think the advertisers would tell them before the readers. Because the constituency is part reader, but also part advertiser. So I think that one of the things, there's an amusing example of a, a journalist called Melanie Phillips who worked for many years as the educational correspondent on The Guardian. And The Guardian prides itself on having a very liberal view on journalists' individual political takes on things. Uh, so each week, Melanie Phillips used to write her education think piece, and every week there was a whole load of letters came in saying, this outrageous, the woman's a Tory, get rid of her. And the editorial team at The Guardian would say, no, no, Guardian readers, you need winding up from time to time. It's good to have your sort of prejudices tested. Until, after years and years of this, Melanie Phillips got a job on the Daily Mail and she could write to an audience that appreciated she was a Tory. Um, so I think The Guardian, I mean, Nick Davis would, would know more about this, but The Guardian does allow more latitude and has more infighting in its letters pages and its online fora because it's, it's more surprising. But ultimately, if you want your world challenged and you're going to newspapers for that challenge, I think that you should be reading something that you know comes from a different perspective, you know is targeted to a different demographic or a different political um, corner. Uh, you have mentioned before that the people just post and also gossip on the social media or the t new technology, they use smartphones. What do you think the relationship between the social media and tabloid culture? Do you think they bring big changes? I think that tabloid, tabloid media, as opposed to tabloid culture, I think tabloid media are struggling because that's one of those really important <coughs> pillars was actually having gossip to sell, actually knowing insider information. But if this is leaking through tweets 24 hours a day, then it's one of those aspects of the tabloids, the popular tabloids, which is seriously in jeopardy. Um, more conventional newspapers, uh, more conventional uh, television news can actually do things differently. Uh, newspapers are much more uh, the branding of opinion now as opposed to the breaking of news. Um, and the News of the World showed the lengths that it was going to to try and stay ahead of that curve, actually hacking into phones to try and find information that people weren't even tweeting um, because it was, it was locked in their phones. 
So I think that's one of the arguments that the tabloid newspaper itself is under threat, not because we've grown out of what they provided, but what they provided has slipped into other parts of our media sphere. Paper satisfy people's emotional needs. Do you think that um, those newspapers um, satisfy audiences intellectual? And if so, how can they um, provide some intellectual information while they entertain and inform audiences? I mean, I, I don't see it as as uh, as binary, as cut and dry as that. I think that there's a there's an emotional attachment to. Uh, reading elite newspapers. Um, there's a social and political identification going on, which is very, very reassuring to readers. Um, I wonder what happens once those newspapers become economically non-viable um, because it leaves a hole in collective identification. Um, Benedict Anderson wrote in, in, in his wonderful book on imagined communities that one of the things that newspapers do down the centuries is they provide this way of identification which transcends space, that you can imagine yourself belonging to a national community through this, this fixed point of the newspaper. And if you look at a very successful online newspaper like the Daily Mail or the Guardian, you'd say, with constant updates and constant shifts and constant Twitter feeds, etc., where, where's the constancy? Where's, where's the community there? The community is probably still clustered around the newspaper, but it's much more dynamic. It's much more um, unstable. And when it comes to um, <coughs> popular tabloids and in intellectual appeal, I think that there are aspects of popular tabloids that go for um, the cerebral for a particular audience. Any other questions? Uh, last, uh, last one. Okay. You just mentioned the tabloid has losing the readership by month and month. And you all, uh, mentioned that the tabloid culture is under threat right now. So do you think uh, what kind of changes or what, what those papers will do in the future to keep their readership? I don't think tabloid culture is in decline. I think quite the opposite. I think that's thriving. I think that's, that, that's what's booming. Um, and social media assists that. Uh, a gossip-driven, uh, celebrity-driven, trivia-driven culture, um, which to a large extent maps onto aspects of the former tabloid newspaper culture, that's not going away. What happens once if tabloid newspapers um, become uneconomical is an interesting question. But as I suggested, I mean, there are still a lot of newspapers being sold. So the question might be, will we reach a point where only one tabloid newspaper is sustainable? And if it's one, which one will it be? Or we look at the way that celebrity news is morphing into different areas, and you say, there's a whole range of magazines, short term sometimes, medium um, penetration in the market, weekly in the main, colour, but they're doing stuff and they're taking readers off the general reading um, tabloid newspapers. So there are various sorts of directions that if one was to speculate, and I don't like speculating that much, but I'd say I think there are still plenty of spaces for the sort of um, one, one aspect of uh, traditional tabloid journalism to, to go into. I think that one, one of the things that becomes, this goes back to the Nick Davis book, because Nick Davis concentrates a lot in Flat Earth News about the perceived um, reduction in quality investigative journalism at the elite newspapers. But actually, if you're looking at the News of the World with uh, their investigations editor, you'd say it becomes more expensive, it becomes more dangerous, even for tabloids to do that sort of expose. So I think that there's that question about how 
good quality, whether it's tabloid or elite investigative journalism, how is that financed within a new media economy? And the, que the answer to that, according to Nick Davis, is very problematic. So I think both tabloids and the elite newspapers uh, and the BBC are struggling for you know, ways to fund uh, legitimate investigative journalism.